Okay, so we'll get started with the second lecture and we'll continue our discussion on sequences. So next topic, so we talked about the limit, so xk converges to x star if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0 there exist n epsilon in the space of natural numbers such that norm of xk minus x star is less than epsilon for all k greater than equal to n epsilon. Um, now not all sequences converge right and we looked at this example of cos of k pi which goes between positive 1 and negative 1 like this. So it's not a convergent sequence. So so what can we do? Um, what can we, is there something else we could understand about this particular sequence which does not converge? Uh, but there is something special about a sequence like this. So. I'm going to define two separate concepts. One is lim inf, which is also written as lim with a straight line in the bottom, just below the lim. And this is, and then another concept called lim soup, which is also written as lim with a uh, bar on the top. Okay? So, what are these concepts? How many of you are familiar with lim inf and lim soup? A few of you, okay. So you can define lim inf and lim soup for any sequence. Even though not all sequences converge, you can definitely define lim inf and lim soup, but for sequences in R, okay? So this is for sequences in R. So Let's define that. So xk k in n is a sequence in real line. I am going to define yk as supremum of xk k greater than equal to no x xm. m greater than equal to k and I am going to define zk as infimum of x m m greater than equal to k. Okay. So you can think of this as supremum of the tail and this is the infimum of the tail. I have a sequence, I truncate the sequence, look at the tail of the sequence, find the maximum value and I find the minimum value. So supremum or the infimum and I come up with a new sequence based on that. Okay. So in this particular example, cos of k pi, I look at the tail of the sequence. So the supremum will always be 1 and the infimum will always be negative 1. Okay, so if xk equals the cos of k pi, then yk is equal to 1 and gk equals to minus 1 for all k in n.
Okay, so what's the cool thing here? YK converges and ZK converges as a sequence. If you think of sequence YK, if you just consider the sequence YK, this converges. And if you just consider the sequence XK, this also converges. And so, so the, the theorem is limb in always exist and limb soup always exist okay now of course limb inf could be negative infinity limb soup could be positive infinity so these are all allowed so you could also have diverges divergence but at least you know that they will converge either converge to some specific point or they could diverge to infinity okay so this is in contrast with sequence where you could have a sequence that doesn't converge right so the limit does not exist but limits always exist but lim and limb soup always exist so what is well i'm defining k from 1 so y 1 will be 1 Yes. And you try to take the uh, soup of that sequence. Yes. As the index marches up, yes. the limb soup would still be like whatever yes. point it was when yes. it started decreasing, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So how is that a sequence? Okay. So what if okay, so his question is what if I have a sequence that is decreasing? In which case your yk will actually be equal to xk. So I want to write that xk is decreasing. xk is decreasing. And then yk will actually be equal to xk. OK? But note, I mean, there is another result which says that every decreasing sequence converges as long as it is bounded from below. Every increasing sequence converges as long as it is bounded from above. This is known as monotone convergence theorem, right? Um, the proof is somewhat involved, but one could show. And it turns out that limb inf, so this is always increasing, and this is always decreasing, and therefore it's a monotone. You can apply monotone convergence theorem to prove that this actually converges. Okay. So in this case, because we're, look, we're effectively looking for the what is it? It's the largest possible point that is smaller than all the rest of the sequence, right? So that if we've got a decreasing sequence, every right. new point is the newest right. infant. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so what are the properties of limb inf and limb soup? Let me write a couple of properties. So the number one property is limb inf of xk is less than equal to limb soup of xk. Uh, naturally, I am taking k goes to infinity. You know, I haven't yet defined what limb inf and limb soup is. So sorry. So limb inf is xk equals to limit of zk and limb soup of xk equals to limit of yk okay that's the definition and like i mentioned uh, this sequence always converges at this sequence always converges or it could diverge to infinity but it's monotonic right so it would either go to infinity or it will converge to some point so even though xk itself may not converge these two limits do exist 
and it could be plus or minus infinity and uh, and this is how you define the lim inf and lim sup of xk and this is the first property which uh, is quite obvious to prove the second property is if minus infinity less than lim inf xk equals to lim sup xk less than plus infinity so which means that lim inf is finite and lim sup is also finite then this implies that xk converges to x star and this x star is actually equal to lim inf xk and that is equal to lim sup xk just the, the sequence version of the squeeze yes theory. yes yes this is exactly squeeze law Okay, and the third property is that limit sum of two limits is less than equal to limit of the sum. So negative infinity would be less than equal to negative infinity. Right. But what if one limit is infinity and one is negative infinity? Oh, I see. So you're saying one of them is going to infinity, the other one. Okay. I guess. Yeah. I guess we need to. Wouldn't that be impossible? Actually, that's not uh, given in the book. So it may be possible. y k is k and this is negative k this is minus infinity plus infinity yeah I guess this side has to be well defined for it to hold right. and for limb soup you have the other way uh, the inequality goes the other way limb soup x k plus limb soup y k is greater than equal to limb soup K plus y k. Yeah, so I guess uh, his point is that the sum has to be well defined for these uh, inequalities to hold and I completely agree with him. So if x k is negative k and y k is positive k, then we have negative infinity plus infinity that is not well defined. Okay. Okay, so those are the properties of limits and limb soup. So you're running an algorithm, an optimization algorithm, you're trying to solve a problem, and what you see is your iterates are oscillating. Okay, so there is no limit because it's oscillating. And what that means is you may not have a limit, the algorithm doesn't really converge to a limit, but since it oscillates, you have a limb soup and you have a limit and that converges to something and most likely your answer will be between those two points okay and as we um, talk about some of these algorithms in the future and we'll talk about convergence uh, what we will what we will show is that there is something called a learning parameter or I mean in machine learning it's called learning parameter 
and in optimization it's called step size. By tuning the step size appropriately, you can reduce this oscillation and you can actually get the fastest convergence. Okay, so your algorithm can blow up, which means that it diverges, right? The sequence diverges. Your algorithm can oscillate, which means that it doesn't converge, but it has a limb inf and limb soup, and that and your answer probably lies between the two. And by changing the step size and making appropriate modifications in the optimization algorithm, you can actually make sure that the algorithm converges to the point that you want it to converge. Okay? So even though this might seem like nonsensical mathematical mumbo jumbo, it's actually useful in practice. Okay? Any question? No? So when you said x k plus y k, the other both sequences, right? So it's the sequence rule that you're in addition to addition Yeah, sequences. addition of sequences. Yeah. Okay, so next I want to talk about matrices and some recall some results from matrices. So if there are no questions, I'm going to erase the board. So I have A in R n cross n. Okay, so A is a square matrix. And the characteristic polynomial of A is determinant of lambda i minus A. Okay, and I'm assuming that lambda is in the complex plane. Okay. What's the degree of this characteristic polynomial? Anyone remembers? Not rank of the matrix. Not rank. Yes. Is it n minus one? No, it's not n minus one. N. Okay. Uh, so let's say a is equal to zero. Okay. Simple. A equals zero. Then determinant of lambda i is actually lambda raised to n. So it's a nth order polynomial. Okay, this is not a proof, but this is one way to guess what the answer to this question would be. Okay, so this is an nth order polynomial. What does that mean? Well, if you have polynomial with real coefficients, it does not mean that the polynomial will have n roots on the real, in the real line, okay? But as soon as you go to complex plane, then you are guaranteed to have n roots, okay? So, the theorem from complex numbers, which I, I don't know whether all of you have taken complex numbers or not, but I know that EC students take complex, some sort of course in complex numbers. Uh, because it's used a lot in ECE. Uh, the theorem is that n degree polynomial has n roots in complex plane. So what that means is lambda 1 to lambda n are roots of determinant lambda i minus a.
okay uh, what that also means is determinant of lambda i i minus a is equal to 0 right because lambda i is a, a root of the polynomial what this also means I mean what this implies is that lambda i i minus a is low rank okay so it is not full rank uh, matrix and so one way to know whether a matrix is full rank or not is just to take the determinant for a square matrix so you can only all you can only take determinant for square matrices so one way to know whether a square matrix is full rank or not is take the determinant if it is equal to 0 then you know that it is a low rank matrix it is, does not have full rank and so this is what is implied when I say that lambda i is a root of this polynomial and such a lambda i is known as eigenvalue So eigenvalue is a pretty important concept, okay. So one thing we know is lambda i minus a is a low rank matrix which implies that there exists v i such that lambda i i minus a v i is equal to 0, right, because if it is low rank it means it has a null space and I can pick a vector from the null space vi and I multiply it with this matrix that gives me 0 because vi lies in the null space of lambda i i minus a this implies that lambda i vi equals a vi Now, for most matrices, lambda i would be a complex number and v i would be a complex vector, okay. So what does this signify? Let me go to the complex plane. Well, this is actually C n. So don't think of it as just a complex plane, but it is actually a C n plane. And I plot this vector v i. So typically if you have a if you have cn and i have a vector v and i multiply this vector by a matrix a the vector gets rotated and scaled so this is my vector av i, I start with a vector i multiply it by a square matrix the matrix rotates the vector and scales the vector but that's not true for true if the vector is an eigenvalue uh, sorry eigenvector for the matrix a in which case it gets multiplied by the scalar lambda i but scalar in a complex plane so a complex number and what that implies is this will be your lambda i v i okay Yes, right, yeah, it could be possibly anti-parallel, yes, that's right. You could have lambda i v i if lambda is a negative number. It's easily understood if v i and lambda i were real numbers, right? So assume that it, they are real numbers or in R n and then you will see that this is actually parallel. So a general vector will get rotated and scaled. An eigenvector will only get scaled but not rotated uh, well you can think of this also as rotation but you know it's just going in the negative direction of the original vector so that's a uh, that's the property of eigenvector now in most cases a square matrix will have well not in most cases in all cases 
a square matrix will have n eigenvalues and in most cases it will have n eigenvectors and these eigenvectors will span the entire Cn. Okay, so any vector in Cn can actually be written as a combination of the eigenvectors of the matrix. Okay, so I have V which is this vector, V can be written as Ai, no, A1, V1 plus An, Vn, and then Av can be written as A1 lambda 1 V1, An lambda N, Vn. Okay, I want you guys to remember this geometric picture. Okay, this picture is extremely important for the rest of the course. So, this is Vi, you could have Vj like this, you could have Vk that looks like this, right? So, these are all oriented differently in the complex. Uh, Cn. Okay, now I want to talk about spectral radius of A. Any questions so far? Okay, spectral radius. So that's denoted by rho of A, and this is maximum of absolute value of lambda i, i equals 1 to n. So this is my complex plane which is basically the lambda plane. I have n eigenvalues and the spectral radius is the radius of the circle that encompasses all eigenvalues. So this is my rho of A. So these points are uh, the lambda i, so let me just write it lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. You might have drawn root locus and stuff, right? So that's exactly what this is. Well, not it's not root locus, but what I'm showing is the eigenvalues of the matrix A in the complex plane. So this is, yeah. So with the spectral radius, is there any point in the complex plane that uh, if we centered there, we would be able to get a smaller radius that included all yes. of the eigenvalues? Yes, well, um, you can, but I don't know whether that has any application. Okay. Yeah. Well, there is one application, but that's not part of this course. It's something called gresh goren circle theorem. Maybe you can look it up on Wikipedia. Okay, so this is called the spectral radius, sorry, the spectral radius, which means the radius of the circle within which all the eigenvalues of A reside. Uh, one of the cool result in linear algebra is Oh, in, before I introduce the school result, I need to introduce matrix norm. So, max of A V over V, V not equal to zero. 
okay, which is the same as, so this norm has to be the same norm on Rn. So you could have a P norm, let me call it P norm, okay, so it depends on which norm you take in your original space. This is same as saying AP is max of norm of B equals to 1 AB. So naturally you have this, based on this definition, you have Uh, AV okay now this is something that you may not have uh, studied earlier matrix norm so this is a nice inequality which might be useful in the future. So what that's what this idea of the matrix norm is saying is that it is the norm of the unit vector you well not unit vector. It's the norm of the vector you get from multiplying A and B yes. of the magnitude of the big Yes. And right. In particular, you say it's the max of max over all possible vectors. Right. That aren't zero. Right. So you start with a unit sphere. Well, this. You start with a unit sphere in R n, and then you multiply matrix. A with this all the points in the unit sphere what you get is something that looks like an ellipsoid right and the matrix norm A of P is the, the is the diameter yeah yeah this this distance whatever this distance is yes so uh, how would we uh, calculate what the matrix norm actually is oh <laughs> uh, how would you compute the matrix norm? Uh, so of course there are some matrix norms that are easy to calculate. So A1 is easy to calculate, A2 is easy to calculate and so on. A infinity is also easy to calculate and this, this, the expressions are given on Wikipedia so you can go there and take a look at it. In general, AP may be very hard to calculate for general P, okay? And I, I want all of you to remember the geometric picture, okay? Because it's extremely important. The number of algorithms we will cover in this, in this particular class will be close to 40. And if you don't remember the picture, you won't remember what the algorithm is trying to do. You will lose track of all these algorithms. So should it be clear that a max exists? Yes. Okay. Um, Why? <laughs> you know, you guys are asking very difficult questions. Uh, you know what is, you know what is a, okay, have you heard of Weierstrass theorem? Yeah. Continuous function over a compact set achieves its maximum and minimum, right? So you might have studied it in, a, you, in an interval Right, but the thing holds in very general state spaces. Okay, good question. Okay, so what's the cool theorem? Cool theorem for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a matrix norm such that 
so so given a given a for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists a matrix norm such that ap is less than or equal to rho a plus epsilon okay okay so this is the cool theorem now what's the application of this cool theorem so let me consider a matrix a such that rho of a is less than 1 and i'm considering a sequence xk equals ax k minus 1 okay so i generate i start from any x not in rn and i generate the sequence xk x1 x2 x3 by this process what do you think would happen okay i have a matrix whose spectral norm is less than 1 and i considering the sequence xk is equal to axk minus 1 what do you think will happen to xk is it going to converge is it going to diverge is it going to oscillate the spectral radius is less than 1 then yeah. it's a it's a tightly sort of constricted circle or sphere right so uh huh it should converge to a small number to a small number what's the smallest number in rn 0 0 zero. <laughs> okay so your claim is that xk will converge to 0 okay but how do we prove it any thoughts how do we prove it yeah um well it, it's going to go back to the matrix norm calculation we had uh for i have no idea how we're going to get there okay <laughs> okay so this is the first proof in this particular class okay and i don't want you to remember the proof but i want you to remember the proof technique yes Okay. Okay. Yes, that's one way, one way to do it. But that requires you to have n distinct eigenvectors of a matrix, right? Now, sometimes that uh, you know a may not be diagonalizable. Okay, so it may not always work that way. Okay I don't want to go deep into the matrix theory but there is an easier way to prove this result okay so your technique does work if a had distinct eigen vectors so a is not uh a is diagonalizable in that situation oh, so here is you see it. so we've got uh the magnitude of the the av p norm is less than all of that and then and we've got the statement Uh, about the spectral radius being less than one, mm -hmm. and so we've got a multiplicative factor that is always going to be less than than uh, the rho of a plus epsilon right. on to the k power, yes. and, and that will, as k goes to infinity, converge to zero. Yes, but then you have to pick your epsilon uh, very carefully. So here is the proof. Okay, I want to prove it. So proof. So I am going to pick epsilon equals one minus rho a over two. So what this would imply is rho a plus epsilon is strictly less than one. Okay, so that's number one. then i have that a of so norm of xk so i get so for this particular epsilon i'm going to get an appropriate p epsilon here so 
P epsilon is less than equal to norm of A P epsilon plus, no, not plus, multiplied by X K minus 1 norm, P epsilon norm of X K minus 1, which is less than equal to rho A plus epsilon xk minus 1 p epsilon and this recursion uh, would imply that p epsilon is less than equal to Okay, and then we know that from squeeze law, we know that xk p epsilon converges to zero as k goes to infinity. And if the norm of a vector goes to zero, it means that the vector itself goes to zero. Okay, so this would imply that xk goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Yes. So I see how uh, a gap in this gap, a special radius greater than one, uh, might give us a proof for, for divergence, but can this give us anything about showing that it's going to be oscillatory? Oh, uh, oscillatory. Well, let's say my, let's say A has eigenvalues that are all less than one. And then there is one eigenvalue that is equal to one. Okay. okay. Or equal to minus one. Then you see the oscillatory behavior. If it is equal to one, then it will converge to the eigenvector that is corresponding to that eigenvalue one. And then the proof can't use who's that. No, then you can't use this. Epsilon no. Not working no. Yeah. Or maybe somehow you could adapt this proof for that particular problem. So essentially what happens is you pick a vector in the space. Uh, along the line, along the uh, eigenvector, it doesn't change the magnitude. But along all other directions, it's going to reduce the magnitude. So eventually that vector will get projected onto the eigenvector. Um, but the proof would be reasonably easy for if spectral radius is greater than one that it's going to diverge. Yeah, then it's going to diverge, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so any questions on this proof? Okay, so this proof essentially introduces you to the underlying idea of why control systems with eigenvalues less than one are stable and why some algorithms converge and why some algorithms may diverge. And as we go through the course, I'll come back to this point again and again, okay, uh, to emphasize why certain algorithms tend to converge and why certain algorithms tend to diverge and so on. Everything follows from this simple observation that you have on the whiteboard.
the next topic is symmetric matrices so a is symmetric if a equals a transpose and some properties are number 1 eigen values are real number number 2 eigen vectors are orthogonal to each other that's for symmetric matrix and then another definition is a is positive semi definite if and only if x transpose ax is greater than equal to 0 for all x in rn if and only if a is symmetric and positive definite if a equals a transpose and x transpose ax is strictly great, greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0 these are the two definitions you would probably recall from your early days when you were young okay positive semi definite matrix x transpose ax is greater than equal to 0 for all x in rn positive definite matrices x transpose ax is strictly greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0 are there other ways by which we could recognize whether a matrix is positive definite or not does anyone remember somebody said something all eigen values are positive right so if all eigen values are positive then the matrix a is positive definite if eigen values are non negative okay so zero could be an eigen value for the matrix in which case it's positive semi definite okay so so in this case lambda 1 to lambda n are strictly positive in this case lambda 1 to lambda n is greater than equal to 0 okay so that's a brief uh recap of what you might have done uh in your linear algebra course Any questions so far? Okay. So during this class on optimization, we will talk about positive definite matrices a lot. Positive definite as well as positive semi definite matrices a lot. So some of the necessary conditions and sufficient conditions would require sufficient conditions for optimality would require certain matrices to be positive definite. okay then you know that you are at a local or a global minimum okay so we will talk about it in subsequent classes but i want to give you a preview of where this all theory becomes useful um in a in within the context of optimization so is the important uh is the important feature there that those matrices therefore have an inverse what is that that matter what matters is this part that, okay okay invertibility doesn't feature okay. but these inequalities to feature there okay um i don't really have time to introduce 
calculus, no sorry, differentiability. So in the next class, we are going to study multivariate functions, functions of multiple variables and functions that map Rn to Rm, okay? So, um, and we will talk about how to differentiate those functions, okay? So you might be already familiar with what differentiability means for functions of one variable. We are going to extend that concept to functions of multiple variables. Okay, thank you. See you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend.